Would you turn to Colossians chapter 3? Colossians 3. Um, I'll be reading from verse 17 to 19. Colossians 3, 17 to 19, and it, the Word of God says, Whatever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks through him to God the Father. Wives, be subject to your husbands as is fitting in the Lord. Husbands, love your wives. And do not be embittered against them. Men, are you ready for the onslaught? (laughs) Don't worry, we're all in it together. (laughs) Um, It's only a short, this is going to be the shortest message I I have ever preached. It's only about 20 minutes. (laughs) You wish. All right, fasten your seatbelt. So we're still continuing on with this marvelous piece of scripture that highlights the life of Christ and how it ought to permeate all our lives in how we interact with each other in a family. It's about Christ. You know, like the moon apart from the sun is a dark and miserable place. So also our marriages, we need to understand this. Apart from Christ, our marriages are lifeless. But also, just like the glory of the moon is so beautiful to gaze upon when it reflects the glory of the sun, so also our roles, our functions at home find their best value, their most usefulness when they embrace the light of Christ and reflect it. Have you ever thought why this is the case? Well, it's because the Father from eternity past loves the Son. He loves his dear son. And so he chose to institute this concept of a family. And his objective is through the family, all of Christ to be put on display. So the wives with their respectful submission, the husbands with their loving leadership, even with Children and fathers, everything. In other words, every role is like a tune that when played together, it forms this beautiful symphony that resound the majesty of Jesus. When we fulfill our roles reflecting Jesus Christ, marriages would be like a beautiful song. Song of praise. Ascending to heaven, and the Father would look upon it, and he would be pleased. Do you get the point? The point is this. Your marriage is not primarily about your happiness. It's about Christ. It's about his majesty being put on display. All right. Well, what's the best way to put on display Jesus Christ? It is the gospel. The gospel. So what does God have to do? Well, it's like God would take the gospel insofar as marriage is concerned and he slices the gospel in half. He looks to the woman and he would say, wives, this is your portion of the gospel. Live it out. And as you play the role, your role out on the stage of life, something about Jesus, the beautiful Jesus will be on display. So since the moment the wife would say, I do, gives her vows, 
And then for the rest of her life, when she voluntarily, willingly submits to her husband, it's ever meant to show to the world that Jesus Christ is desirable to follow his lead. And we looked at that last time and we said, well, that's great. Makes perfect sense. It's wonderful. Good. That's the first part of the gospel. What about the second half? What about the husbands? How should they display Christ in their role? What tunes of the gospel should be played out in their roles? And I come to this point and I want to say to everybody, I believe that men have a bigger fish to fry. Because while women have only to do with submission, you just submit to your husbands, the, wife, the husbands, on the other hand, now here is the, the three points that we're going to be looking at today. They've got to be leaders. They've got to be lovers. And they've got to be admirers. Leaders, lovers, admirers. We'll break down the scripture and we'll look at each part as we um, look into the word of God. Number one, leaders. Verse 18. It says, wives, be subject to your husbands. Well, if wives are to follow the husbands, then what is God expecting of you men to do? To lead. That's the first call, is to lead your wives. Now, we looked at it last time in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 24. Um, because wives are to be subject to their husbands, to you husbands, in everything. So which area is God expecting you to lead him? Every area. Every area. Now, it doesn't mean that you do everything. It means you lead in everything. It doesn't mean that you, you don't delegate ta any task. It means that you are responsible for every task, financially, spiritually, parenting, working. Men, we are to rise up and lead. You are hardwired to lead your wives. We'll come to this point, and of course, we know what the world thinks. You know, some say, well, Wes, don't, don't be so close-minded. Don't you know that women can, do, can lead the same way as men do lead? I mean, don't, don't be stuck in this old, rusty idea. Wake up and smell the coffee. Well, well, that train left this station a long time ago, this silly hierarchical structure. You know, we live in this, uh, the rise of technology and now women pretty much can do just about every single kind of job men can do. And they can lead, whether financially, spiritually, I mean, just the same way as men would do. What's the problem? Why, why are you stuck up to, to and, and, and not only that, you know what they do? In the name of Equality in value, meaning wives and husbands have the same value, which is something that we obviously affirm. But in the name of this, what did the feminist movement do? They, they, they tried to burn any and all distinctions between husbands and wives. And they brainwashed multitudes of people, pretty much the entire world, to believe that lie that husbands and wives are co-leaders, right? That's what we hear in the news, at universities, wherever you go. How do we respond to this? Well, in Genesis 2, when God created Adam, before, he, before Eve was created, we find in Genesis 2.15, it was Adam that was meant to cultivate and to keep the garden. In other words, he is to take care of God's business, to take care of his kingdom. And it was to Adam, God commanded him in verse 16, from any tree of the garden you may eat freely, but from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat. That was before Eve was created. It was only later when he created Eve then you, you, need, you need to think about this. How did Eve then learn about God's command? She didn't know. Well, Adam, 
You must lead in teaching your woman what God says. And, and when God said in verse 18, I will make him a helper suitable for him. Please note, God did not say, I will make him a co-leader. Helper. What does helper mean? Very simple. When you read it, even in the ancient Hebrew, you find it, it means assistant. Someone to support him. Adam, you are to lead in laboring and toiling, and the woman is meant to come beneath you to assist, to help as you are taking care of God's kingdom. That's in Genesis 2, and then you move on to Genesis 3. Even at the fall of humanity, who sinned first? It was Eve, right? But when God came to call them into account, who did God speak to first? It was Adam. It didn't matter that Eve sinned first. In verse 9, it says, Yahweh God, God called to the man and said to him, Where are you? Adam was held responsible. You see, that's why we, 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 the fall is not called Eve's sin. It's called Adam's sin throughout the scripture. Jesus came to be our second Adam in order to fix up the mess that first Adam created, right? This is God's word even today. Man, where are you? Husbands, fathers, where are you? You know, suppose that your wife messes up and Jesus coming and knocks at your door and she opens to him. Do you know what you would say to her? Where's your boss man? Where's that bloke in charge? I want to talk to the man of the house. This is the way it's always been. No matter what the society says, no matter how much the world tries to feminize our culture, that's the way it is in the sight of God. Man, you are to lead. Amen, brother. Preach it. Preach it. We want our women to hear this, right? But you know what our problem is, men? We, we love the privileges of being a leader, but we don't like the responsibilities that come with it, right? We don't. You see, you don't just lead in the areas that you like to lead, and the other areas that are really annoying to you, we check out, and we become spineless, and we hand over this headship to the women. Like we said, when men lead, they are to lead in which area? In every area, in everything. You know, you get some men that would say, you know what, I work, I like to work, I don't mind providing for uh, financially for the family. So I'll lead in this area, no problem. But to lead in other areas, it's kind of painful. I'm, I'm content to be a bank machine. That's all. And so what happens is that you find many men of this world, they justify the fact they work long hours, and then they come home and they pretend that they're wearing invisible cloak. Nobody, nobody can see them. They switch off their brain, both feet on the coffee table, and they stare at this idiot box until bedtime. Right? No, men, you come home after a long day at work and guess what? Your day has only begun, right? Because you are to lead in such a way to display how Christ leads the church. Number one, you lead spiritually. Meaning you take initiative in teaching the word, in discipling, in disciplining. You make sure Christ is continually preached at home. You huff and you puff the gospel until you blow the house down. Number two, you lead in protecting the family. 
If an intruder breaks in and you're in the bedroom, you don't run and hide underneath the bed and you say, honey, remember the, the baseball bat is behind the cupboard. You, you, no. What do you do? You get up. You do what you have to do, even if you have to use your body as a shield. Right? You lead. You lead. You take initiative. All right? Who gets to squash spiders at home? <laughs> All right? Or catches mice, right? Men, you lead. You lead. And number three, you lead relationally. Relationally. What does this mean? You know, when a church needed forgiveness, when they were in enmity with God, who initiated the process? I want you to tell me. Who began to reconcile? Was it Jesus' fault in the first place that man rebelled against God? No. But was it not Christ that initiated that reconciliation? That is the leadership. What does this mean? If there is a conflict at home, guess who ought to initiate reconciliation and forgiveness? No matter who started it. It is you, man, not woman, and it's unnegotiable. Why? You are to lead relationally the way Christ leads the church. So you relentlessly go. You find out what is going on. You, you go, you negotiate, you discuss, you reason, and you don't put your head on the pillow until the matter is resolved. You do your bit. We're all guilty now, but the truth must be told. So what's your role, men? What does it mean to lead? Where, it begin? Where does it begin? It begins with this. You get on your knees. You say to God, God, show me how Christ leads the church. Lord, work through me. Display Christ's leadership in me. And then you begin to play out this role. So in what you do and in what you say, as you're playing out this role, the world would see how Christ leads his church. You take initiative, you, you're in that leadership, uh, whether it's going to cost you everything or nothing, it doesn't matter, you lead, you take initiative. Leader. Number two, lover, lover. Verse 19, husbands, let's break it down. Husbands, it's married men who identify as men, all right? 30 years ago, 20 years ago, I wouldn't say this, but it has to be said. It's in plural, husbands, this addresses all men. There are no exception to the rule. And what do the men have to do? They've got to. Love. Love who? Your wives. Okay, well, that's easy. I love my wife. Okay, that's good. What do you mean you love your wife? Well, I, I give her a couple of expensive presents every year, right? Or uh, I give her the freedom to fulfill all her goals and, and dreams in her life. Or particularly with the new wedded uh, husbands, you know, they would say, oh, I have lots of feelings for my wife. Ah, every time I'm next to her, I get, I get goosebumps. In fact, I get goosebumps right now as I'm thinking about her. Now, is this the love that husbands are to exhibit? It's called agape, agape love. It is more than romance. It is far more than affectionate kind of love. Of course, there's got to be truckload of affection and obeying his command. So don't get me wrong. You go and you read Song of Solomon in your own time, and, and you'll find that marriage relationship is meant to be full of affection. But agape love towards a wife is far more than that. So how do we know what this love looks like? Well, would you turn to Ephesians chapter 5 where Paul expounds, he, he fleshes out this 
love your wife more. In Ephesians 5, verse 25, the both books, mind you, by the way, Colossians and Ephesians, were circulated at the same time, and Paul was expecting a church of Colossae to read the book of Ephesus and vice versa. So um, it is right and proper in its context to read and understand what it means to love your wife when we read Ephesians 5. We'll start from verse 25. It says, husbands, love your wives. Here's the command again. This is agape love. Now, what does this love look like? He tells you, just as, meaning exactly as. Exactly as what? Christ also loved the church. How did he show that love for the church? He tells you, gave himself up for her. That's far more than just friendship kind of love or romance kind of love. Your duty in marriage is to play out this part of the gospel. Which part? Your role, husbands, is to show how Christ loved the church. He gave up for her not expensive presents, Not his wallet, but himself. This is as selfless as selfless can ever be. Just, just ponder upon what it really means that Christ gave himself up for the church. Just reflect on what this actually means. Jesus Christ, who is God, truly God in human form. Truly divine, full of glory, and though he continually been worshipped by angels in heaven, but driven by love, he came down to save the church. Who's the church? It's, it's you, it's me, it's us. Hell-bound sinners, deserving God's judgment under God's wrath, Christ saw that we are headed for hell. Headed for that torment, and he moved with compassion towards us. He became a man. He lived among us, uniting himself with us to do what? To save us. But then what happened? And instead of receiving this honor that is due to him, the very people that he loved rejected him. His enemies mocked him, they spat upon him, they tortured him. On the cross till he was disfigured beyond recognition. His own followers denied him, betrayed him. His earthly family, what did they think of him? That he was a madman, retarded. His heavenly father punished him. And though he is the Lord of lords, yet he willingly lived out as like a slave of all. Serving everybody, even to the point of death. Brothers, sisters, when the church kneels before this Savior and would ask the Savior, why? Why, Lord Jesus? Why? Why would you do this? Why, being Son of God, you suffered physically, emotionally, spiritually, such an agonizing life and death? Was it worth it? What would he say? Why? Because I love you. That's why. But, but we're, we're monsters of iniquity. We're like beasts before you. How many times have we rejected you or shook our fist against you? And even now, in our own stubbornness, that we reluctantly follow your lead. Because we're too selfish. You would say, I love you freely. I love you not because of what you are, but in spite of what you are. I love you. And I would do whatever it takes to save you and to forgive you. Was it worth it? What would Jesus say? Absolutely, yes. It's worth it. Brothers, isn't this a crucial part of our gospel? 
that we'll even die by this? And God granted man to have this privilege, this honor to play out this part of the gospel again and again, not just by what he says, but how he lives his life with his wife. What does this mean? How does it look like? Let's break it down even more. What does this lover really mean? Well, number one, it means to love your wife unconditionally, regardless of what kind of imperfection in her, physically, spiritually. Love that towers over any and all flaws in your wife. Right? You love Christ. You love the fact that he loves you freely, don't you? He says, go. Play out this role with your wife. Number two, you've got to love her sacrificially. What does that mean? It means you put her needs above yours. We're not saying you compromise the leadership. Of course you lead. But if you come to a fork on the road and you have to choose between your happiness and her happiness, guess what you would choose? Hers. Her health above your health. Her peace above your peace. Her dignity above yours. I had a coughing fit last night. <clears throat> and I thought about this. If, 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 you're, if you're in bed and, and you were coughing or snoring and she can't go to sleep, guess who should get out of the bed and go to the couch? It's you, man. You laugh sacrificially. You do this. And if she says, no, 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 I'll go. You insist, no, honey. No, I'm the one who ought to be playing out the role of Christ, not you. I gotta get out of bed. I gotta go to the couch. Number three, not, not the third point of the sermon, but purposeful love. Unconditional, sacrificial, purposeful. What does this mean? You know, some husbands, um, they think the height of godliness in their role, like they, they reach the um, zenith of godliness when they make their wives happy, okay? I know wives, it's going to hurt you a little, this one, but I'm just going to have to preach the word of God. Now, husbands would say, you know, you know, they, they, they like to, to brag, and then they would say, I love, I love my wife to the point that I really, I'm willing even to relinquish my, my leadership call. I, I just want her to do whatever she wants, just to make her happy. You can do whatever you want. See how godly I am. But you know, when, when men say that, you know what they're really thinking? Most men, when they say that, what they're really thinking is that, I want to make sure that this woman doesn't disrupt my kingdom. I don't want her to disrupt my peace. Um, uh, I know what I'll do. I'll polish her idols. Never mind her godliness or anything to do with that. I'll get her to pursue her happiness, her dreams. Uh, it's, it's a small price to pay so I can live in harmony. I can live and have a good life. Right? Man, I want to tell you, this is a virtue that is cooked in hell. That is not meant to be our purpose. Imagine this was Jesus to the church. Imagine Jesus would say to the church, Ah, oh, you know, church, I don't care what you do. So long as it makes you happy, go and pursue your own dreams. Really? That is not Christ to the church. Look at the end of Jesus' love for the church. We're continuing here in Ephesians 5. He says here, verse 26, 27, so that, so that, that's the purpose, right? So that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word, that he might present to himself the church in all her glory. 
Continuing on, having no spot or wrinkle that is spiritual spot, spiritual wrinkle, or any such thing, but that she would be, and that is the purpose of all purposes in, in that marriage, now she should be holy and blameless. I, I don't need to exposit this, brothers and sisters. Let me tell you what John MacArthur says as he comments on this. He says that a Christian husband should not be able to bear the thought of anything sinful in the life of his wife that displeases God. Shouldn't be bearing any thought that she is sinning against God. But then he continues on, he says, his greatest desire, meaning his purpose of loving her, his greatest desire for her should be that she become perfectly conformed to Christ. So he leads her to purity. That ought to be our purpose. Your purpose of loving your wife ought to reflect Christ's purpose for the church. Her inner beauty. Her holiness above all. When you're tired and you're at home, and you find your wife is lazy and she doesn't want to come to the Lord's Day or to fellowship, what do you do? Just stay, hang out with me. I want you to stay with me. Brothers, what is your purpose in loving her? She needs to grow in holiness. Number four, it's a unifying kind of love. Unifying kind of love. We continue reading verse 28. It says, so husbands ought also to love their own wives as their own bodies. Unifying love. He who loves his own wife loves himself. For no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes, nourishes and cherishes it just as Christ also does the church, because we're members of his body. Again, it's always a reflection of Jesus Christ, everything that we do. What does this mean? I want to ask you, how did Christ become our sin bearer? Think about this. I know we spoke about it months ago. How did our sins be transferred to him? If he's a different person, how is it fair for someone else to be punished for another? Answer, because Jesus united himself to us. It is such an intimate unity between Christ and the church that, that our sins could be transferred to him. Jesus hugged your souls with his soul, such that the scripture says that we are one spirit with him. Beautiful mystery. And you husbands are to reflect this part of the gospel. So in your marriage, so it says in verse 31, for this reason, it is because of that oneness, that unity, that Christ has with the church. For this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and shall be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. We ought to reflect the oneness the church has with Christ. God, in a mysterious way, made the two of you one flesh. What does this mean? In other words... Whatever hurts your wife ought to hurt you. Whatever upsets her ought to upset you. And whatever pleases her pleases you. Verse 29 tells us that you cherish and you nourish your body, right? You gotta constantly cherish. And nourish your wife. Unceasing care for her well-being. You've got to be a lover. Not just a leader, but a lover. Lover. Unconditionally. 
sacrificially, purposefully, and united. One flesh. That's your role, men. That's just like the Christ with the church, right? Leader, lover, and we're not done yet. It's just the beginning. <laughs> oh, third point, you also have got to be an admirer of your wife. Admirer. So we continue going back to Colossians 3.19, the last part of it, it says, and do not be embittered against him. Embittered? What does this imply? You know what it implies? Paul has in mind, there will be a time of frustration. There will be a time of irritation. It will happen. You only need to be married to a wife and let the, let the honeymoon pass and you will know that this will happen. There will be time when her failures will rub you in the wrong way. Your peace will be threatened, your comfort will be robbed away from you when her kingdom collides with your kingdom. And you know physics, when two objects are in opposing directions and they collide, there's explosion. What do you do? Well, in these moments, brothers, Remember Christ. What does this mean? Aren't you thankful that Jesus never ever uses your failures as license to unleash his wrath upon you? Aren't you thankful? Don't be embittered. Don't be worked up. Don't make a big deal out of little things. Now, what does it mean to be embittered? How does that show? How do we show that we are embittered? Just, just in case, because you say, I may, no, 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 hardly ever um, become embittered towards my wife. What does that really look like? Well, it looks like when we abuse our authority and turn our leadership into dictatorship. I'm the man of the house. And you become domineering. You know, by, by, by the rod of the voice, because we're louder and deeper, stronger. Come on, I'm the man of the house. It's got to be what I say, because that's what the Bible says, that I'm the man of the house. I'm not going to reason. I'm not going to explain to you. You just have to listen. But when we become cynical, Put them down. You know, you get these husbands that like to police everything that the wife does and try to find any excuse to, to get angry. The micromanage everything. Or by ignoring them, neglecting them. Or by leading by the letter of the law rather than being gracious to them. <coughs> well, if we do that, we're not being like Christ, are we? We're being like the Antichrist, right? So if, if I want to avoid being embittered, what should I do? What should I do? Well, we'll finish with this passage, well, with one verse in First Peter chapter 3. 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 17, uh, verse 7. First Peter, first Peter is written primarily to unbelievers, but don't use this as license and say, well, it's not for me. Yes, it is for you. Because it's, it is written specifically when there are clashes, when there are conflicts. And if, if it goes so far as that's what you do for unbelievers, how much all the more for believers, believing wives. 
Okay, so it says this in verse 7. You husbands, in the same way, live with your wives in an understanding way. You've got to understand your wife. Understand. It doesn't mean that you've got to micro-examine her in order to oppress her whenever you find a fault, point finger at her. That, that's not what it means. Look what it says. As with someone weaker since she is a woman. Newsflash. Your wife is not a man. She's a woman. In other words, you can't treat her the way you treat your mates. Weaker vessel, meaning she's more delicate. You know, when, when we hang out with our mates and we joke around with them, but we joke around in ways that we should not be joking around with our wives. You know, we give them punch in the shoulder, high firing them. We treat our wives not the same way as we treat mates, men. You know, you can have men, man to man talk, and you have this forthright confrontation with him, and then you say at the end, well, you know, I call a spade a spade. What you see is what you get. Great, that's fine, do that. But not your wife. She's a woman. She's not hardwired this way. Look what it says. Live with your wives in an understanding way. Do you know what this means? Once you got married, congratulations, you just got admitted to the marriage university. And you're enrolled in one subject. That's your wife. And you will never graduate. You're in for life. You always live with an understanding way. So what you have to do for the rest of your life is that you've got to read her. You've got to understand her. You've got to study her. You've got to be patient, trying to figure out what she's trying to say. You've got to be a good interpreter of your wife. Let me give you just a quick example. When a man speaks to a man and he says to him, just can you please tell me why you did such and such and such? Why, why don't you care for this? What he really means is that I want you to tell me the reasons, the basis on which you draw the conclusion that you choose not to care for that thing, that subject. But when your wife comes to you and says to you, whether she's angry or she's crying, and she says, why? Why are you not caring? She's not a man. Because what she really means is that I'm hungry for you to care for me. I'm starving for you to care. I didn't care about the reasons. Stop giving me reasons. I want you to care for me. You've got to live with understanding. So what do you do if you live with understanding? It says, show her honor as a fellow heir of the grace of life. Show her honor. You've got to cherish her. You've got to treasure her. You've got to humble yourself and consider her as your precious possession. So you lift her up. You're not embittered. You lift up. You don't put down. You exalt. You admire her. Show her honor. Precious possession. Now, I don't want you to misunderstand me and, and use this as license to be a needy. A clingy person. You know what I mean? Clingy person. You know, where someone would impose on, on his wife to just to be chained to him all the time so that she would fulfill his selfish personal needs. You know, I would say, well, 
you know, well, I, I thought she was my precious possession. And then demand on her to be your personal Messiah. Brothers, only Christ is ever meant to be your all-satisfying being. Only he to be the lover of your soul. We find our identity not in the love or respect and submission of our wives. We must never ever idolize our wives. This is not a license to impose upon your wife to be someone that God never made her to be. Only Christ to be the source of our fulfillment not our wives. He alone is the living waters. He's the only fountain that we ought to go to and allow us our soul to drink from. In fact, it is precisely only when we worship Jesus this way that we can treasure our wives and that we can function properly as leaders, as lovers and admirers without any reciprocation, without expecting anything back in return. Can you see, brothers, that the purpose in marriage is not so much about you as it is about Christ? It's not so much about your happiness in, in your wife and how she submits to you and respects you. No, it's about your happiness in Christ and how he loves you. 24-7, how he leads you, how he loves you, how he admires you. And it's reflected in your role towards your wife. So what I said to the wives last time, I would say to you, brothers, how much are you showing off that beauty, that beautiful Christ? Again, if we installed microphones, cameras in your house, if we put something to measure the pulses and the thoughts of your mind, would we find your role in marriage bear witness that Jesus is a wonderful Savior indeed? Brothers, we need to reflect on this. We need to examine our lives. Let us be honest. How far have we derailed off the track of what God intended for marriage to be? How much have we made it to be about me, myself, and I, about ourselves, rather than stepping out of the, the spotlight so that the beauty of Christ to be displayed in our leadership, in our love, in our admiration of our wives? Where do we begin? I just want to finish with one extra verse, one final verse. And that will help us to begin the right way. As we repent of our sin, let's just turn to James 1.17. As we repent of our attitude and how we made marriage to be our, about ourselves, as we move away from that, as we go and, and beg Christ to reveal to us how beautiful he is to us as our leader, as our lover, as our admirer. And as Jesus begins to shine his image upon us and we enjoy that, I want you to see James 1 verse 17. And the scripture says, every good Thing given and every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shifting shadow. Every good thing given and every perfect gift is from above. You know that it wasn't a mistake for God to give you this wife of yours. God never makes mistakes. Do you know, no matter her moral or physical condition, do you realize that the word of God, do you believe that the word of God says every good gift and every perfect gift 
is from above? Do you realize that? Your wife is the perfect gift from God to you. With all of her flaws and all of her failures, she is the right person to you. That's what the scripture says. Where do you begin? You begin with this. You turn to your wife. If you believe what the word of God actually says, you turn to your wife. You tell her this. You tell her you are the perfect gift from God to me. Nobody did that. Why? What's wrong with you? Tell her that. Before we finish the sermon, you tell her that now. She is a perfect gift. Lead by example. Lydia, you are the perfect gift from God to me. <laughs> How are you going to do it? How are you going to lead properly? How are you going to love properly? How are you going to admire properly? You've got to go back to God. You've got to go back to Christ. Again, we say it again and again and again. Not until Christ, with all of his beauty, not until you see him and you enjoy him as your own leader who takes initiative, and every time you stumble, he comes to you. He reaches out to you. Not until you enjoy his sacrificial, unconditional, purposeful love to you. Not until you know and enjoy what it means that he's one with your soul. And not until you truly believe that he does admire you. With all your flaws, he does admire you. He does cherish you. That you are his precious possession. And you say, thank you, Lord, for this. Such a humbling thing to know. Not only until you worship him as he is truly God. There is no way you can function this way. What a humbling thing. God gives you a command and he knows that the only way to obey it properly is to worship him properly. Amen. Let's see where we have fallen and repent. Lord God, thank you, Lord, that you make your word clear. It's not, it's not hard to understand. It's just hard to live out. But with Christ, with Christ in our lives, Oh, how he makes every burden easy. May we all enjoy Jesus Christ. May we adore him and praise him. Not only with lip service, but indeed in truth. As we lay down our lives, for our wives. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.